I want your soul. Every night as I lay in bed, I heard the screaming, the shattering of plates and glasses as my mother and father fought and threw everything at each other within reach. They were drunk again, as usual. I just hoped the police wouldn't come again tonight. I wished they could be happy. Finally, around midnight, the voices started to fade. I felt my eyes closing as sleep came over me. But just before I nodded off, I glimpsed a pair of eyes with black slitted pupils peeking at me from the corner of the room. Beneath them hung a wide, grinning mouth. The mouth had dozens of triangular, razor-sharp teeth that glistened bone white in the dim glow of the nightlight. Unattached to any visible flesh, the eyes and mouth floated in the air like wavering moonbeams. I sat up in bed, stuttering. What? What is this? I whispered, staring deeply into glowing eyes. Am I dreaming? Oh, no, not dreaming, Alice. Just mad. The thing hissed, its sharp fangs pulling apart. It gave a high-pitched insane cackle at this. We're all mad here, but your father, he's the maddest of all, I'm sorry to say. Or perhaps he's just a little odd. It's hard to be sane every single day, Alice, after all. Who, who are you? I quietly asked as a shard of terror pierced my heart. A childish voice in the back of my mind screamed at me to simply pull the covers over my head and hide. The Cheshire Cat, of course. I'll be your guide when you need me. Your adventure will be starting any second now. His eyes glimmered brighter as a scream rang out from downstairs. I heard my father yelling, and then a gunshot rang out, shattering the night. Something heavy fell, thudding against the floor. Ah, there it is. The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, after all. What, what do you mean? What's happening? I asked in horror. The Cheshire cat's glowing face faded like the embers of a dying fire, but his voice continued to speak in the darkness. Heavy footsteps started to ascend the stairs. Something cold and empty slithered through my heart as a feeling of dread overcame me. He's coming, the Cheshire cat said in a gleeful tone, the voice coming from all around me. If you want to live, jump out the window. You have ten seconds to decide. Alice, I heard my father yell drunkenly, slurring his words. Come here now, goddammit. I need to talk to you. I jumped out of bed, slammed my feet into my shoes, and flung open the window. Five seconds, the Cheshire cat said cheerily. I looked down from the second story. My heart dropped as I saw the fall. You better jump, Alice. You don't want your adventure to end before it even gets started. I then heard a hand roughly grab the doorknob. I crawled out the window, slowly letting myself down by my arms. My father then flung the door open. The front of his white shirt gleamed with slick, wet blood. He had a black revolver in one hand. With wild, excited eyes, he scanned the room, stumbling forward. His head ratcheted towards the open window, and for a moment, our gazes met. You little bitch! He screamed in rage, raising the gun. You're just like your mother, always trying to leave. I'll show you, you stupid little bitch. As I let myself drop, a gunshot exploded through the night. The window above me exploded in a shower of broken glass. I screamed as the chill night air whipped around me, and the garden below rose up to meet me. I felt like I was standing on the tracks as a train barreled down towards me. I hit the dirt hard, rolling as I landed. A bush with sharp branches clawed my shoulder and back, gouging out burning slices across my skin. I glanced up, seeing my father drunkenly leaning out the window, his eyes unfocused. A totally insane, ferocious expression twisted his face into something inhuman and demonic, and I barely recognized him. Why was he doing this? 
Why was he trying to hurt me? You fucking stupid bitch! You stupid cunt! He screamed, firing the pistol twice more. One of the bullets smashed the lawn only a foot in front of me, spraying glass and soil everywhere. I shrieked, sprinting across the yard in my shoes and pajamas. The dewy grass soaked my feet within seconds, but I knew I had more pressing problems than shoes. I glanced back at my home, seeing the window was empty. A thick forest loomed at the edge of the property, and a blanket of shadows covered it, but I could barely see anything. I knew, though, that I had no choice. I sprinted into the woods, blindly tumbling through prickers and grasping bows. A torrent of flickering orange light suddenly illuminated the night. As I descended deeper into the woods, trying to hide myself, I looked back at my home one last time. I saw a raging inferno there. Long tongues of flame hissed and spit as they licked the dry wood, flowing over the walls like water. And in front of the hellish flames, I saw my dad, a dark silhouette with a gun, striding purposely across the yard after me. As my eyes adjusted to the dark forest, I caught a flash of something white sprinting through the bushes. I nearly screamed, startled into a state of terror. The creature turned its pale dead eyes toward me. He towered over me, about six feet tall. He had floppy rabbit ears surgically attached to his mutilated skull. Black stitches ran over his face in jagged patches, keeping his rotting flesh together. His white fur had a rainbow of fluid soaked into it, from blood to orange and yellow pus to other things I could have never hoped to identify. New trickles of blood and pus continued to leak out from the stitches crisscrossing his body. In his arms, held between claws like those of a tiger, I saw an unconscious child. The child had a deep gash on its forehead. His head lolled from side to side like a ragdoll's. I'm late, the rabbit hissed at me, his cataract eyes glimmering with insanity as they shone white in the pale moonlight. You see... I have a very important date, Alice. The Red Queen is expecting the blood of a child for her shower, as she does every full moon. What keeps the skin fresher and younger than the blood of a little one, after all? His lips cracked apart in a wide grin, mottled with sores. His pointed needle-like teeth reminded me of some nightmarish deep-sea fish. I stood there, speechless, until the sound of cracking twigs and whipping branches not far behind me, startled into action. I started running, giving the insane rabbit creature a wide berth. I glanced back, seeing my father's pale, sweaty face through the brush. His lunatic eyes flicked from side to side. He kept the gun held out in front of him. His arms swang gently as if he were caught in some hypnotic state. Alice, come here right now. If you keep running away from me and I catch you, I'm going to fuck you. How dare you run from me? I'm your father. I only glanced at my father for a second before turning my gaze forwards again. But by then, it was too late. In the panic of the moment, in the darkness of the forest, I didn't see the six-foot-wide hole that stretched across the earth like a gaping maw. I gave a startled shriek as my foot dropped into empty air. Before I knew what was happening, I was slipping, my arms pinwheeling. I tried to regain my balance, twisting my body around. I saw the rabbit there only a few paces away, grinning at me, the unconscious kidnapped child slung across his shoulder like a bag of potatoes. I fell backwards. The scream that tried to rip its way out of my throat seemed to get stuck there, and I could do nothing but stare blindly up as the rabbit lunged in after me with a cry of excitement. The last glimpse I caught of the forest showed my insane father stumbling towards us, still crying my name, with drunken fury. The air whipped around me, the roar of it like the whine of a tornado shrieking in my ears. The hole at the top shrank into a pinpoint as the rabbit and I fell downwards together into total darkness. We seemed to spiral around each other. No matter how hard I tried to pull away, the rabbit always seemed to be right there. The last glimpse I saw before the shadows closed in was the rabbit's dead eyes, flashing excitedly as he glared at me with a face like a corpse. Then, the shadows drew around me like a curtain shutting on a stage, 
Only my screams and the ragged breathing of the rabbit surrounded me for what felt like an eternity. Slowly, my consciousness slipped away, and after that, I remember nothing for what felt like a very long time. I awoke suddenly, inhaling deeply. I shivered, my teeth chattering as I looked around in confusion. I beheld an alien landscape stretching out to the horizon. Gently sloping hills of black earth loomed in every direction. There were no grass or plants visible, but giant red and white mushrooms the size of pine trees grew in clusters along the peaks of the rolling hills. Streams of fire crisscrossed the landscape like rivers from hell. The sun here drifted along the slit wrists of the horizon. It looked like a cold purple ball of fire that gave off a soft, moon-like radiance but very little heat. Thin, Silvery clouds covered the sky in rising plumes of pale mist. The entire world looked dark, all the colors eerie and saturated, almost like the desert at the end of a sunset. I looked around for any sign of the surgically altered rabbit creature or the unconscious boy he had been carrying in his arms or, even God forbid, my father. But I saw no signs of any of them. On top of a nearby mushroom that loomed twenty feet in the air, however, I saw a familiar glint of glowing eyes, their slitted, dilated pupils looking down with insanity. The dragonfish-like teeth of the creature's mouth shimmered in his eerie, ear-to-ear -ear grin. Over the course of a few seconds, the rest of his body became visible as well, fading into view for the first time. I nearly gagged as I looked up in amazement. It was a disgusting thing to look at. The Cheshire cat was entirely hairless. His skin black and reptilian. Patches of his flesh were rotting away, and his tail had started to look like a stripped wire. White bones and infected veins writhing with maggots gleamed through the separating sores. Cheshire cat, I whispered, licking my dry lips. What happened? Last I knew... I was falling. There was some hole in the forest, and it seemed to keep going on and on forever. And there was a rabbit, but not a normal rabbit. It was like a rabbit from a serial killer's nightmare. The Cheshire cat laughed at me, but it wasn't a pleasant laugh. It reminded me of the laugh of a man who just had his throat slit. It was gurgling and deep, and carried through the cold, dry air like a scream. The nightmares swarm across this world like a plague of locusts. The Red Queen's evil and sickness has infected the very foundation of existence, he said. The barriers between Wonderland and Hell itself seem to grow thinner by the day. As he said this, the glee never evaporated from his expression. Across the horizon, a thin, high-pitched scream rang out, full of pain and mortal terror. The Cheshire cat's head swung slowly toward the sound, and I followed his gaze. In the distance, I saw a narrow castle with razor-sharp turrets that disappeared into the silver clouds high above. The murder holes spiraled up the outside of the dark granite surface. A giant flag rippled softly in the cold breeze. I squinted, seeing a black flag with a red heart gripped in a skeletal hand. Drops of blood dripped out of the bottom. They call it the Chateau de Dolor, the Cheshire Cat said by reason of explanation. The home of the Red Queen. It sounds like another victim has fallen into her clutches. What? Another victim? I stuttered, a sense of horror filling my body with a sick, weak feeling. The Cheshire Cat gave a slow, jerky nod. His eerie, gurgling laugh rang out suddenly, making me nearly jump out of my skin. That's right. The Red Queen seems to think that bathing in the blood of children will keep her young forever. She has an Iron Maiden set above the royal shower. Every month on the full moon, her insane, psychophantic followers bring her sacrifices. Young children, boys and girls no older than five or six years old, usually. The younger they are, the more purifying their blood's properties, you see. The Cheshire cat's teeth 
gleamed as another far weaker scream rang out through the night. It was cut off suddenly, and the eerie silence that rang out in the aftermath felt deafening. Ah, there it is. La petite mort. The little death, he said gleefully, another laugh ripping its way out of his throat. You know, I don't see how that's funny. You think the Red Queen murdering children is funny? As if he was offended by my change of tone, the Cheshire Cat's rotted black body started fading out, but his grin didn't falter. I think that if you don't start running soon, you're going to experience it firsthand. The Cheshire Cat hissed, his voice echoing from all around me, as the last gleam of his eyes faded away. Beware, Alice, the White Rabbit draws near. I stumbled through the dark, cold world they called Wonderland. The black earth under my feet felt soft and smooth. The smell of the giant red and white fungi that covered the landscape like redwoods permeated the area, giving off a smell like mushrooms after a heavy rain. I went in the opposite direction of the Chateau de Delure. The pale purple sun had started to disappear over the horizon. The night's edge slid across the sky like a razor blade, plunging the world into darkness. Within a few minutes, I could barely see more than twenty feet in front of me. The silvery mist I had first seen in the sky now started spreading its ghostly fingers over the ground, covering the world in a blanket of pale fog. I heard the white rabbit before I saw him. In a harsh, dissonant voice, he sang. His voice carried all around me, raising goosebumps all over my skin. When the queen's eyes looked down from the sky, they gleamed like the slit wrists of the sun. Her pale face watches, her dead eyes dry. Their small faces shriek, what she's done. I could not stop the children screaming, and I could not stop the acid eating the dead. I could not stop the dead men from dreaming. I could not stop the voices in my head. Fragments of moonlight shine on a kitchen knife, crimson and ruby red and gleaming. But the rabbit knows no peace in life when the children's voices never stop screaming. As I heard the rabbit's song, I ducked behind the giant trunk of a mushroom, and I caught a glimpse of white fur with a spiderweb of black, garish stitches running across his back. Slung across the white rabbit's shoulder was the unconscious body of the child, with its head rolling from side to side. The white rabbit was heading in the direction of the castle. He continued bellowing out his disturbing, strange verses as his voice disappeared off in the distance. Exhaling deeply, I slunk out from behind the massive white fungal trunk. I stopped suddenly, a shard of dread piercing my heart as I saw what stood there before me. A large man in a ripped-up walrus mask loomed over me, a blood-stained meat cleaver clutched tightly in one hand. The brown mask only covered the top half of his face. It had two giant white tusks jutting down past his chin. He had on a tight-soiled t-shirt that might have once been white, but was now covered in a disgusting rainbow of stains. His fat belly protruded over his belt. The rolls of fat jiggled on his neck as he gave a strange, high-pitched laugh. They call me the walrus, he hissed through a mouthful of broken, rotting teeth, grinning at me. As he exhaled, I smelled rotten meat in the sickly sweet reek of infection. I backpedaled quickly in horror and revulsion. I ate all the little ones, I did. My sweet little clams, the children of the damned. He laughed at this, advancing on me. His dark eyes shone with insanity and hunger behind the eerie mask. With a greasy, muscular arm, he then grabbed me by the neck. I was put into a headlock and forced to stumble along behind him, my breaths coming in choking gasps. He pulled me into the mist, and for a couple minutes, we went on like this. I continued struggling, trying to beat the giant man away with my hands, but he was too strong. When his grip loosened slightly, a powerful echoing scream escaped my lips. Help me, someone! Cheshire Cat! I began, but he tightened his greasy, bulging arm around my neck, cutting off my oxygen. The world started to turn white, and a rising sense of animal panic swept through my body until the walrus finally 
mercifully relaxed. I drew in a deep breath that tasted as sweet as honey, gasping and sweating. Don't do that, my little clam. His cracked lips had split into a furious grimace. His eyes shone with hatred. You are courting death. Don't you know the sound draws on the Jabberwock? He looked around nervously at the name. As if in response, a high-pitched animalistic roar ripped its way across the night. It reminded me of the screaming of a woman being burned alive. The echoes faded slowly, but with the mist so thick around us and the sky looking like a flat piece of slate, I couldn't see him more than ten feet in any direction. Ahead of us loomed a shoddy, one-room cabin, and the walrus murmured to himself, gnashing his destroyed teeth as he looked down on me hungrily. You are a beautiful little clam. I think you'll make a nice meal for Mr. Walrus, he hissed. Indeed, you are a very tender, little yummy clam. With one greasy, dirt-stained hand, he flung the cabin door open and threw me inside. The smell of cooking meat rotting flesh and feces, smacked me in the face. It was so thick I could taste it in the back of my throat, and I bent over, vomiting. The walrus closed the door as quietly as he could, peering through a tiny smashed window in the mold-ridden boards of the dilapidated cabin. I could see a little girl crouched in the corner, starved and shivering. On a rough wooden kitchen counter, I saw small, dismembered fingers and eyeballs. Spools of intestines were rolled up like sausages next to them. A raging fire in the fireplace then flickered and danced, illuminating every corner of this cabin of horrors. Over the fire, a child's torso roasted, the fat spitting and dripping in greasy, burning drops. It was just the torso, with a ragged patch of bloody neck. It ended at the navel, with pieces of torn organs hanging out and blackening. Into the cage, my little sweetie, my little honey, the walrus whispered, pushing me forward. Then I heard the animalistic cry again, this time much closer. Get the fuck off me, you fucking asshole, I screamed, pushing the walrus away. I tried to run for the door, but in a giant single bound, he tackled me. I began shrieking for my life, trying to claw at the walrus's eyes. He then punched me hard in the face, and I saw white spots, bright stars that flashed across my vision. As my head rolled, I tasted coppery blood dripping from my mouth and nose, and the high-pitched scream came again, directly from outside the door. Help! Help! I cried. He's trying to hurt me! He's going to kill me! The walrus then froze, looking up. His dead eyes flashed with horror and a deep, ineffable fear. That was when the entire front of the cabin exploded. Shards of splintered wood pierced my skin like tiny hornet stings. The walrus then jumped off me, backpedaling quickly towards the back of the cabin. I raised my head, and there and then met the eyes of the Jabberwock. Like a dragon from an acid fiend's nightmare, it raised its powerful body to its full height, looming twenty feet above the ground. The Jabberwock's skin gleamed a slate-gray color. Hundreds of pencil-thin appendages hung down from its enormous, fish-like face. The slow, rhythmic tapping of the fetid slime that dripped from its body mixed with its powerful breathing. Its flat, hungry eyes bulged out, dark and lidless, reflecting the bloody light of the fire. Its enormous lungs inhaled and exhaled as it stared at us creating the same whipping of wind and fury that a barreling train might produce. The Jabberwock's neck slithered out, writhing and serpentine, like some ancient Brachiosaurus's neck. Its head hung low below its shoulders as it moved forward in a jerky, crawling gait, its web dragon-like feet sliding across the soft black soil of Wonderland like a berserk centipede. It opened its mouth, showing hundreds of spiraling teeth that pulsated and twisted like the mouth of some demonic lamprey. The Jabberwock tried to force its entire body through the crushed wall. Crouching down and giving another high-pitched scream, its black eyes rolled in its head, showing bloody veins at the bottom. 
The walrus tried to sprint for a back window, but the Jabberwock snack slithered out, like a toad grabbing a fly out of the air. Its lamprey mouth struck out in a blur. It attached itself to the walrus's back with a sucking sound, and blood exploded from the walrus's body, splashing the coarse floor and broken walls of the cabin. I then started crawling away. The panicked and agonized shrieks of the walrus carried through the air, accompanied by wet crunching and sucking sounds. As the Jabberwock shook its head like a dog with a chew toy, spatters of blood from the walrus's mutilated body sprayed the inside of the cabin. The frail, trembling girl in the cage in the corner cowered back from the destruction. The Jabberwock's tail whipped from side to side, long and tapering like the tail of a dinosaur. Sharp, bony spikes protruded from the ends. With a tremendous crash that shook the ground, its tail smashed into the cage, and the girl gave a squeak like a strangled rabbit as the cage soared across the cabin and crashed into a wall. She tumbled head over heels inside of it. Then the cage's door fell open with a clatter of metal, and the girl crawled out, her stunned eyes sweeping over mine. I silently motioned for her to follow me, and as quietly as I could, I crawled through a massive hole in the collapsed front wall. I glanced back and saw her close behind, her skeletal arms pumping quickly. A glimmer of hope then flashed across her sunken, haunted eyes, a look I remember even now when I lay in my bed a few days later. As we got out to the black soil of Wonderland, in the thick mists of its endless night, the cabin fell into a heap behind us. The Jabberwock continued to thrash in the rubble, and the sounds of bones cracking and sucking followed us down the rolling hills. What's your name? I asked the girl. She looked like a survivor from a death camp. It was strange seeing such shell-shocked, dead eyes on such a young face. She couldn't have been older than six or seven, with raven black hair and ice blue eyes. Marianne, she whispered, looking around furtively. I'm Alice, I said, giving her a comforting smile. We continued walking quickly down the hill. Giant mushrooms passed by on both sides. In the distance, the dim glow of the castle lights gave an eerie radiance to the clouds of mist that passed like thunderclouds in front of its many spiraling windows. Keep your voice down, she said in a low, scared tone. The Jabberwock can hear the slightest sounds. I've seen it. It puts its head down on the ground and just listens. I think it can even hear footsteps sometimes. I looked at her in total shock. Are you from this place? She shook her head, a wave of deep sadness passing over her face. I was taken from my home. I used to live in California, but I was kidnapped by the walrus. He's crazy, you know that? I nodded. Well, he used to talk to himself a lot, and I would listen. He had another girl in the cage when I got there, but he ended up... She paused, looking like she wanted to vomit. He ended up boiling her alive and then eating her. Oh my god, I whispered, horrified. Her face had taken on a greenish cast at the memory. But the walrus also talked about the gateway they used, to kidnap children from our world. Apparently, the queen's followers pass through it all the time. It takes you wherever you want to go, as long as you think about it while crossing through. I stopped, grabbing her shoulders and turning her to face me. My heart thundered in my chest. Are you saying there's a way out of this hell? And she nodded slowly. That's what the walrus said, but he's crazy, she repeated, glancing over to the castle looming over us like a guillotine. But according to him... It's in the basement of the Chateau de Delors. I immediately began walking toward the castle, but the little girl shook her head violently. I'm not going in there, Marianne said, her face chalk white, and I took her hand. It's the only way, unless you want to stay here forever. We have to go into the castle. Your family is probably worried sick about you, and we need to get you home. The woman there is very sick, Alice. She does bad things to children. Marianne cried in a quivering voice as tears started to stream from her eyes. I continued to take her hand, pulling her forward to the castle. 
I wanted to leave this horrifying place as soon as possible. We walked on quietly, the occasional cries of the Jabberwock ripping through the air. I wondered what had happened to my father, whether he was still stumbling around the dark woods all alone. The castle loomed up through the fog, the flickering yellowish glow through its many murder holes piercing the mist like daggers. In front of the castle, I saw two soldiers clad in medieval armor, with crossbows held in their hands. They sat in two chairs next to the open gate of the castle, and I tiptoed as close as I could, watching them, but they didn't seem to move or speak. They didn't even seem to breathe. I wondered if they were mannequins, or statues of some sort. Then, I saw the thick blood dripping from their open helmets. Marianne and I snuck closer to the door, making sure to keep ourselves out of view from anyone inside. I found the soldiers both dead, a bullet hole torn through the center of each of their faces, like dripping tunnels of gore. What the hell? I whispered as I heard my father's voice ringing out from inside the castle. Where the fuck is she? Where's Alice, you goddamn bastards? I heard him screaming. I grabbed Marianne's hand and drew her forward. We peeked around the corner of the gate, but no one was in sight. It was just a front entrance hall with flickering torches and cobblestone floors, walls and ceilings. Hanging from the walls, I saw painting after painting of a woman with very dark, dead eyes, and a broad smile that showed glittering metal teeth. She wore a poofy Rococo dress covered in countless red frills, bows and lace that would have been at home in the time of Mary Antoinette. That's the Red Queen, Marianne said, crossing herself as she uttered the name. God, please don't let us see the Red Queen. We followed the corridor straight into the heart of the castle. Graded metal doors covered the sides of both walls, most of them closed. From behind the doors, I heard soft weeping and moaning, and an occasional scream of agony. I quickly hurried Marianne past them. Do you know where you're going? I asked, but she shook her head. I've never been in the castle, she answered. I just know the entrance is down below. We turned a corner and I found the grinning insane face of my father standing there, his gun drawn. Hey there, baby girl, my father said, grinning. Remember me? I've got something for you. He cocked the pistol and put it directly to the front of my forehead. Its cold circular barrel felt like an eel's mouth kissing my skin. He then gave a cold, venomous look at Marianne. He grabbed her roughly by the neck and pulled her along as he prodded me forward with the gun. I wanted to do this in a private place, not in a hallway. I know you deserve your mother's fate, though, you stupid bitch. You brought us all down here to hell, didn't you? I know this hell. I've been here before. His voice deepened as he said this. I tried to protest, but he continued to scream in insane gibberish. As we walked down the hallway, a giant set of slatted metal doors loomed ahead of us. They suddenly flew open. The white rabbit stood there, grinning at the three of us. His needle-like teeth gnashed together. His mouth chattered excitedly. Have you brought new sacrifices to the queen? The white rabbit asked, excited, his bone-white eyes twinkling. This is my daughter. I will discipline my own child like I did my wife. The white rabbit laughed, a gleeful cheery sound. My father then raised the pistol, his hand trembling as he pointed it at the rabbit. Move aside, you stupid motherfucker. I have no issue with you. My father ordered. The white rabbit then nodded happily as he gave a squeak of pleasure, and he disappeared in the shadows of the dark hall. My father continued prodding us forward through the doors. As soon as he stepped foot into the hall, a gleam of metal swung through the air, and I instinctively shrieked. Marianne pulled loose from my father's grasp as a gleaming metal croquet mallet came down hard on his head. His skull exploded, and black hairs stuck to bone fragments scattered in every direction. The pistol then went off, the bullet flying into the enormous stone ceiling high above us. I looked up at my savior and seen a tall woman dressed in a fluffy, blood-red dress. She wore a crown of sharp silver spikes with tiny skulls impaled on the top of each. 
Have you come to join the circle? The Red Queen asked, her metal teeth flashing as she gave a wide smile. Her eyes looked flat and dead, almost painted on like the eyes of a doll. I glanced above her head to the left side of the enormous chamber. To my horror, I saw an iron maiden there, a metal coffin hanging, suspended by a series of thick cables to the ceiling. A spiral staircase on wheels was pushed next to the Iron Maiden. Its lid was tightly shut. Drops of fresh blood continued to drip out of the bottom. They gave a slow rhythmic pattering like Chinese water torture as they fell into the clawfoot tub below. It was filled to the brim with glistening crimson fluid. I scrambled to my feet seeing Marianne already running down the hall in the opposite direction. I followed after her, pushing my exhausted body forward and hoping for a miracle. The queen gave an insane cry, and I heard metal clattering hard across the ground. Looking back, I saw her running after us. The blood-stained metal mallet held high above her head. Her insane eyes twinkled with the thrill of the chase. As we turned down the random hallways, I found a servant staircase leading both up and down, Marianne had almost run past it, but I screamed at her. Marianne, come back, I said, and she turned, and I pointed to the stairs. There's a way down. Come on, Marianne, we're late. She nodded, her pale, thin face looking beyond exhausted as we stumbled our way down the steps. The Red Queen was still only a couple paces behind us. At the bottom of the stairs, a cold prison-like basement loomed in front of us. Children were chained to the walls, many of them crying and covered in blood. At the end of the basement, I saw a giant mirror, but its reflection was strange. I didn't get to look at it for more than a moment, however, before Marianne collapsed at my side. She was breathing hard, her eyes rolling, her sunken face twitching. I, I can't run anymore, she whispered as the Red Queen gave a lunatic battle cry. I tried to pull Marianne up by her hand but within seconds, the Red Queen had closed in on us. I backpedaled quickly as the mallet came down on Marianne's skull, squashing it like a bloody pancake. I felt sick and weak, but my adrenaline screamed at me to get out of there. I then turned toward the end of the chamber. A mirror flashed in front of me, nearly ten feet tall and surrounded by intertwining silver vines. I could see myself reflected in it, but the background was not the background of the castle. Instead, I saw a dark forest and a burning house. I ran toward the mirror, and behind me, the Red Queen screamed in fury. I felt the whizzing of air behind my head as she swung her deadly mallet. As I hit the mirror, I felt the sensation like warm water covering my skin. Everything went translucent, wavering and fading in and out. I continued running, and after a few steps, the dark forest materialized around me with a popping sound. I cried out as I tripped over something heavy laying in the brush in front of me. Groaning, I looked back and I saw my father's body laying there, his head smashed into a disgusting soup of curly black hair and brains. Police sirens shrieked on the nearby road. Their blue and red strobing lights filled the forest with a sudden illumination. Their brakes squealed as they pulled up in front of the burning house, and a few ran out yelling orders and screaming for fire trucks and ambulances. Light-headed and gasping, I pulled myself up and ran toward the flashing lights and away from that portal to hell. As the police drove me out of there, I heard a Johnny Cash song playing from the radio up front. Now I remember after work, Mama would call in on all of us. You could hear us singing for a country mile. Now little brother has gone on, but I'll rejoin him in a song. We'll be together again up yonder in a little while. One of these days, and it won't be long, I'll rejoin them in a song. In the crimson radiance of the sunrise that streaked across the clouds like streams of blood, I thought I could see the faces of my mom and my dad. Not them as dead or insane as they had been on the last horrible day, but back when they were happy and together. I broke down then, crying uncontrollably the weight of the tears that overflowed from my eyes feeling as heavy as the entire world. And I knew that my life would never, ever be the same again. My name is Alice, and I will see you again. <laughs>